Hello, welcome, welcome back. Um, we are uh, on schedule with the next presentation. Um, in a moment, uh, Sterling Quinn will be on the broadcast. Uh, Sterling teaches courses on GIS, geography, and resource management at Central Washington University. Uh, his research topics include crowdsourced maps, cartography, and landscapes, and the adoption of free and open source software GIS in education uh, and, and government. So uh, the title of this talk will be Using FOSS Free and Open Source Software to Teach University GIS Courses Online, Lessons Learned During a Pandemic. Uh, so Sterling, welcome. Hi, uh, good to see you. Let me uh, just uh, get my slides shared up here. Okay, so likewise, like, good, good seeing you too. I hope you're having a good, a good conference so far. Yes, this is, uh, this is wonderful. I'm very happy to be here. <laughs> um, let me Thank go you. here. Yeah, when you, I'm going to add it to the stream as well. So the stage is yours. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. So um, I'm just uh, really excited to share a little bit about uh, some of the education work that we've been doing with uh, FOSS at our university. I'm going to share some of the tools that we used uh, for specific uh, GIS lessons. Uh, I'm going to talk about some of the challenges that students faced uh, with the software and resources that we used uh, to help them learn. Um, as soon as Phosphor-G was announced for uh, Buenos Aires 2021, um, I was super excited about that. Uh, I started planning my trip. Um, I had great memories from uh, Phosphor-G Argentina 2017, um, which I attended and uh, was one of the best conferences I've been to. I think it was six days long of action-packed stuff. Uh, there was an academic roundtable. There was uh, technical workshops, talks, keynotes, a hackathon, um, all kinds of stuff. And so I, I knew that uh, this would be an awesome conference. I even got to meet Mafalda, which is my favorite uh, Argentinian cartoon character you can see in the lower right. Uh, one of the reasons that I was interested in coming to this conference was the um, uh, I was studying some of the factors behind uh, FOSS adoption in South America in general because I noticed there was, a, a, I guess, a more uh, open climate towards FOSS than uh, we have uh, here in the United States. And I was, I was kind of interested in that. And I had also heard about the uh, Hail Inquietos or Hail Livres group that puts on these conferences. And uh, I'm interested in some of the technical communities uh, in South America that were promoting FOSS, especially for GIS. And uh, wrote up some of those some of those things that I observed at, at the conference and that I've and with the other technical groups uh, in this paper, which I thought I would share just because uh, I thought it might be of interest to this audience. And I might reference some things from this uh, throughout the talk. Uh, again, I was uh, uh, impressed at how much FOSS was used in uh, universities in South America. Uh, here in um, in the United States, uh, it's a little bit different climate. I think there's more of a, a stronghold with uh, proprietary GIS software, and that applies to the university environment and some professional environments. Uh, this um, slide is from a little study that was done uh, looking at 1,000 GIS job postings in the United States uh, a couple years ago, looking at the skills that were mentioned in the job posting that the employers were looking for. And um, you can see at the bottom bar, uh, a lot of them just mentioned Esri software as a, as a skill. Um, there are many other types of spatial analysis and GIS skills that were being sought out that didn't have a particular software attached. And so this is where uh, I think a door was open for FOSS in, um, in education. And uh, I wanted to, um, this is not going to be a talk about how we replaced a bunch of proprietary software all with FOSS but rather uh, how we got FOSS to have a seat at the table. Because when you have this much demand for proprietary software, it, there can be a lot of pressure from uh, students and faculty and employers to, to teach that. Um, but what, what we don't want to do is um, just give students the impression that GIS equals one particular piece of software. Uh, what, what I want to have happen is to show them a variety of things that they can use. Um, We're at a very fortunate moment because uh, FOSS uh, GIS has become 
uh, so easy to use and download and install that students can easily get it and, and apply it and use it. Uh, for students to be able to use it at home, it has to be easy enough that they can find the downloader, go through the installer more or less on their own with a little bit of guidance. Um, but I, I think that we're there. And as students see how they can complete the same workflow with a variety of tools, they realize that they're learning concepts, not a particular piece of software. And they become more versatile and attractive to employers. Um, in my opinion, as if I were a potential employer, I think the thing that I would look for most in students is the, or uh, potential employees is the ability to learn new software and pick up different kinds of software packages uh, on the fly. Um, and that's the kind of thing that we'll have to do because software is always going to change. Um, also, the faucet gives students more tools that they can use to deal with uh, crashes or bugs or roadblocks that they might find when they're alone in the lab working on their, their stuff late at night. What do they do? Now they have various kinds of software that they can use to get around the issues. And it prepares students who might want to use the software for uh, volunteer or nonprofit work or prototyping work. Uh, so there's just many advantages. And some of these uh, Peter Mooney talked about yesterday in his talk and uh, did a very nice job at, at mentioning those. But just as FOSS helps uh, students to be more resilient, it can also help uh, university GIS programs to respond to unexpected demands. And those might include things like financial or administrative demands uh, for more online coursework or uh, COVID-related requirements for going online. So that's what I'm going to talk about in this case study. Uh, just describing what uh, we did uh, here at the, the university where I teach. Uh, this is in Washington State in the United States where the star is. Uh, that's on the other side of the country from the city of Washington. So we're actually kind of a medium-sized uh, university here uh, that caters to all kinds of different um, income levels and age groups, mostly of students from the Seattle metro area. We have a lot of non-traditional students, uh, adult uh, students who are returning uh, for more schooling, and uh, we get to serve them. And I think it's a, it's an enjoyable part of working here. Uh, we offer several kinds of flavors of geography degrees, but also a GIS certificate that can be added onto any degree. So a lot of our students are coming from many different departments around the university. And uh, when we start this certificate, we have a core sequence of three classes, an introductory class, a data management class, and a GIS analysis class. Those are the three that I'm going to talk about here. Uh, I started working here uh, five or six years ago. Um, there's a paper uh, that's really interesting where Aaron Shaw talks about um, the adoption of free and open source software in the Brazilian government under the Lula administration. And he uses a term called insurgent experts uh, to describe people who show up and they have particular skills and they want to change um, uh, the environment or culture or curriculum. And so I wanted to be kind of an insurgent expert with FOSS, um, but also realizing the reality that uh, it wasn't going to be possible with, with multiple faculty and well-established courses to totally overhaul the curriculum. So I uh, wanted to introduce some FOSS and we started doing that just where it made sense. So there were things that the proprietary software could not uh, easily do uh, as well. And so that's where we started uh, putting FOSS into the curriculum. For example, uh, downloading OpenStreetMap data, um, QGIS has always had really nice tools for doing that in the GUI. So uh, we started using QGIS to teach that, get students familiar with it. Uh, we also use the Geoda software for um, uh, exploratory spatial data analysis. There's really nice linked views between the scatter plots and the maps and some tools for doing spatial statistics. Uh, we started using PostGIS when we taught uh, SQL and and GDAL commands when we started teaching about uh, uh, command line and batch processing environments. So there were just ways that we can naturally work FOSS into the curriculum and kind of get, get people used to it. We began doing this in a more deliberate fashion when the um, university or the department wanted to start offering an online minor and major programs in geography. That was going to require at least to have an introductory class in GIS um, and that was where the reality uh, became clear that uh, the students might not have access to the campus lab. Maybe they were living on the other side of the state while taking courses. Well, uh, the ArcGIS Pro software that had traditionally been used in the instruction requires uh, uh, to run well a 64-bit Windows machine with a, a decent amount of RAM and a good graphics card. And uh, some students didn't have that environment available um, uh, in their home computing environment. So we 
made the decision to, uh, to provide QGIS instructions for all the lab assignments and, and just make a parallel QGIS uh, instruction track and allow students to choose which software they wanted to use based on their hardware, their career goals, and their own personal preference. And uh, we, uh, uh, these were some of the skills that were taught in that introductory uh, GIS and maps class, uh, or I guess some of the QGIS functions that we introduce them to, for example, loading uh, streaming map services, making map layouts, and just doing kind of some basic uh, digitizing. And this went pretty well. Um, we decided to implement more GIS courses uh, online in this format, but we were kind of doing it at our own leisurely pace uh, until COVID happened. <laughs> Washington State was one of the first in the United States to actually have a, a real outbreak of COVID-19. Um, in, it was in a, a long-term care uh, facility. And uh, the governor was pretty aggressive about shutting things down at that point, including the schools. And so uh, the schools, including the universities, the state-run universities closed um, about two weeks uh, prior to the start of spring quarter in 2020. Now for us, the spring quarter is at the end of the academic year. And so that's actually when we're covering some of the more advanced uh, GIS materials. So we had to kind of skip a course and uh, implement the more advanced course first with the, with the FOSS. Now, again, the student home computing environments really varied and this time it was even more. So whereas a student before might know that they were gonna take a GIS class online and maybe they upgrade some of their computer if they can, nobody expected the pandemic, laptops were hard to find. Um, the loaner laptops from the university ran out. Um, the university tried to implement a virtual machine solution, uh, which got online kind of late and it was a little bit clunky with the GIS and students had trouble saving the state of their projects. So when the virtual machine went away, they lost their work. So we, we didn't find a good workaround around that. And so we had to accommodate situations where students were using all kinds of different computers. Uh, and this is where FOSS again really helped us. Uh, we made the decision to implement more courses with alternate instructions, but we needed people to help with that because of the short time frame. So this is where a team effort was really useful. We had graduate assistants that were uh, kind of redeployed onto this, as well as uh, support staff, tenure track and non-tenure track faculty. So it was really a kind of a group effort to do things like researching what tools we could use in the lab assignments, um, updating assignment instructions, uh, recording demo videos, testing software workflows. Uh, so all of these people help with that. And uh, I'm just going to show some tables of uh, the tools and the skills that we taught in these courses. And I'll refer you to uh, the full paper that is associated with this, uh, with this talk. That has the extensive tables showing all of this stuff. So I know this is a lot of words, but you can go and reference it in the published uh, paper, which I'll, which I'll link to at the end. Just some of the highlights um, in the GIS and data management course. Uh, we covered the, um, the georeferencing plugin, which is helpful, different kinds of attribute queries and spatial queries. And we actually had all the students, regardless of whether they were using uh, proprietary software or not, uh, we made them install uh, Postgres, uh, SQL, and PostGIS with a small local installation so they could practice database queries with SQL. And for some of them, uh, it was an eye-opener uh, how fast those could do uh, spatial processing when they were used to a uh, slower software <laughs> uh, geoprocessing environment. Um, in the GIS analysis course, uh, we were very happy with the, the functionality that was available through QGIS, uh, particularly the 3D map view. We do a lot of stuff with terrain, uh, hydro modeling. Um, we had the Saga toolbox available. This is where it was helpful to have some of our staff uh, to be able to do a little bit of advanced research on uh, research in advance on what uh, tools would be uh, the best uh, workflows for us to teach. And, and one reason that I've shared that here. We also uh, found uh, good plugins for geocoding and uh, we did visibility and view shed analysis, um, interpolation methods. We continued using Geoda for some of the spatial statistics and um, we used the process modeler to show students how to uh, chain tools together and kind of put them in, uh, put them in order. And so uh, this was, uh, we found that we could mimic the, uh, the functionality that we had been doing in proprietary software just fine with open source software. 
there are a few areas where we want to expand and in, um, including a network analysis and web app, uh, web map service development. Those are some of the things that due to time, uh, we uh, fell back on some of our previous methods that were browser based and accessible to all students. Um, we uh, found success with recording short video demos for the students. Uh, we tried to keep them under 10 minutes long uh, just to, with granular topics on how to do different kinds of GIS stuff. Uh, the students loved these because they could go back and pause and replay them uh, multiple times. And for some students, that was very helpful. In fact, I'm going to keep the videos when we return all the face-to-face -face teaching. I'm still going to have these videos on uh, linked for students so that they can um, remember the concepts that they learned in class. Now, when I was recording these, I thought there must be tons of other GIS instructors out there recording demo videos right now. <laughs> And so we wanted to share them. And as uh, when we finally caught our breaths last summer, um, we made a YouTube channel, a CWU Geography YouTube channel, where we shared these demo videos. And hopefully they'll be of use to uh, other instructors and students. Uh, when students are alone late at night in the lab trying to finish their assignment before the deadline, and I'm not available on email, um, I hope that they'll find these. <laughs> Uh, these resources useful, um, but we wanted to share them with the public because we're a, we're a public university and we, we kind of view that as, as part of our mission. We also wanted students to have some ability to collaborate and, and get face-to-face -face help. In the past, we've offered that in our uh, teaching lab, which has about 30 computers and students. It's open 24-7 for students to go in and help each other and work together. There's a TA there sometimes. What we did instead was we created a Zoom space that was a recurring meeting that was always open. And we staffed it with TAs and staff um, almost four week that first term, uh, just dividing up the hours. And we would sit in this Zoom meeting and if somebody popped in, a student needing help, they could share their screen and we could talk to them face to face. And that, that really helped them to feel like somebody was available and they weren't on their own. And we've since found that we haven't had to have it, have it open for 40 hours a week, but we do have regular um, online hours now, and we'll probably continue to do so for, for quite a long time. Um, some of the challenges we faced um, were related to the benefits of QGIS. So one nice thing about QGIS is you have all these toolboxes and tool sets that are integrated. A challenge, though, is if you search for a tool, you might find four or five different versions of that, and students uh, needed some guidance of, of which one to use. Um, and so that was where some of our advanced research ahead of time uh, could try and head that off and, and kind of guide them to which ones to use. Some of these tools had different levels of uh, 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 documentation, different parameter sets. And so we wanted to, to provide them guidance before they hit those things. Um, let's see. Well, one thing we found is that even though we gave students the choice of, of FOSS and proprietary software, a lot of them still chose to use the proprietary software. And so one thing I'm interested in is that we could survey them further on is why they chose one or the other. I have my own suspicions. I think that a lot of them had started before the pandemic, they had been using proprietary software in some of their courses, just because some instructors favor it over others, or maybe they liked the user interface. And so um, I think when the pandemic hit, the last thing students wanted to do was try and learn a new piece of software at the same time. They were in maintenance mode where anything that could stay constant or stable, they wanted to keep stable. Uh, and this is actually a rational decision that goes along with uh, re research on FOSS implementations, where it, it, migration should, to FOSS is best conducted when there's a real and present need to do so. And some of these students who resisted at first in implementing FOSS uh, later were willing to try it out once they had gotten more comfortable during the, with the online learning. Maybe they hit something in proprietary software that wasn't working or was kind of clunky for them. So then they were, were willing to try out the FOSS. Uh, other students may have been following the demands that they perceive in the U.S. Uh, job market for proprietary software. And perhaps the situation that I've described is, it is, would be very different in other regions of the world with higher usages of, of FOSS, uh, such as uh, parts of Latin America or Europe. But still, though, I think we considered the FOSS implementation a success. This is a photo from happier times uh, before COVID uh, with students who are nearing graduation. So that's why they are so happy here. And uh, we are happy too when this happens. Uh, each student has a dream. And one of the best things about teaching is helping students to uh, achieve that. And 
these dreams are just as real and just as important even when the students are online and we can't see them face to face. And uh, we want to keep those uh, kind of close to our hearts and minds to be able to help them. And the FOSS allowed that to happen for students who uh, didn't have the computing environment or ability to run the proprietary software. Uh, the FOSS opened some doors. I've also seen how it's opened some doors to students who want to um, volunteer with GIS or to, to practice their skills after graduation without uh, dealing with the uh, owner of software licenses. Uh, and it also has allowed them to uh, prepare to work in uh, a variety of situations with, with FOSS. Um, I'm really appreciative of the, the faculty and staff that helped to implement this. As I mentioned, there's a full paper that's now available that describes all the things that I just talked about uh, in a little more detail that you can reference. Um, I've put a link uh, I've archived it here on, on this website, and so I encourage you to check that out. Uh, just to end, I'd like to mention that I am, uh, I'm interested in developing partnerships with educators uh, in Latin America who might want to work together on um, international teaching uh, uh, exchanges, maybe just exchanging a class with a guest lecture, or even collaborating on research. Uh, uh, so if you're interested in creating such partnership, uh, please reach out to me. Uh, I speak Spanish and a fair amount of Portuguese, and you can email me in whatever language that you feel uh, comfortable with. Uh, I would love to get to know you and continue uh, participating in the community. And uh, I really appreciate your, your attention during this talk. Um, uh, thank you so much for the opportunity. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Sterling, for the uh, great presentation. And we have uh, lots of questions and lots of good feedback in the, in the, in the, in the chat. So, oh, boy, um, good. Okay. Yeah, so I mean, I'm going to have you for a while to answer those questions if it's okay with you. Yes. Okay, so the most upvoted ones. Um, can you share your excellent textbook? It says, I think you are going to share the links. Oh, what textbook do I use? Uh, yeah, the textbook you are you or, or the or the curriculum that you have devised uh, implementing FOSS. Well, um, the interesting thing about the textbook is I'm also trying to move to an open, to free and open textbook mentality here because I had various students that the or books that the students would buy. Um, we used a, for a long time uh, GIS Fundamentals by Paul Bolstad. I like that book. It's not really tied to any one particular piece of software. And then for the students who were using ArcGIS, we I used the um, uh, kind of a cook, ArcGIS cookbook book that had instructions. Um, but what I'm moving towards um, is uh, using for the more, um, well, for the intro class, there's a, uh, Oh, it's on the Open Textbook Library. Um, uh, I wish I could remember the authors. Anyway, there's a free GIS textbook there that's, that's pretty good. I think one of the authors was from UCLA. I, if somebody knows that, please put it in the chat. Or I can do that later as well. Um, I'm Also, for the more advanced classes, I'm using uh, articles out of the gis &T body of knowledge online, which is just an online resource on different uh, with peer-reviewed articles on all kinds of different GIS topics. And I'm trying that out this year, uh, just so students don't have to buy a textbook. And I was pretty happy with the variety of topics that were, were offered. Okay, thank you. Um, going to the next one. Uh, nice challenge. What is the most important point for a good lecture? Uh, good lectures on the videos. <laughs> uh, I would say I'm trying to keep them short and focused. So rather than just pressing record and recording an hour or two of lecture, trying to break apart the topic so they stand alone. Um, and so I, I have two kinds of videos that I tend to record. One of them is like a lecture on the topics where I might use a PowerPoint and some more of the theory behind things. Those can be a little longer, sometimes 10 to 20 minutes. Other kinds of demos are, or videos are like software demonstrations. And those, uh, I try to keep those under 10 minutes uh, and kind of I try to avoid using language that would tie them to any particular quarter of instruction or uh, time of the year so that I, they can be reusable. So I would put them in, um, that, that's so I can put them on YouTube and share them, uh, or uh, I can reuse them in other quarters so I don't have to re-record all my videos um, uh, just to save, uh, save time. Okay, cool, thank you. Um... 
you mentioned interpolation with grass. Surely that must have been a big ask for students to install it. Did you just demo grass or did they use install and use grass as well? Good question. So they use the grass tools that are in the integrated into the QGIS uh, processing toolbox. So they didn't have to do uh, a separate install. I just had them open the shortcut that goes to QGIS with grass. Cool. Thank you. Um, did you survey the students at the end of the semester to get their opinions on this approach? Do you have other questions? Asked? No, but I think that would be the logical next step to kind of carry on this this study. And I, I'm interested in getting into their minds about uh, why they uh, they picked certain kinds of software and workflows. I did ask a few of them kind of individually and 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 pick I picked up information as they commented throughout the the quarter. Some of them really did, but they really liked the opportunity to learn open source software and they gravitated toward it just because they already had that interest. And like I said, I think others were a little more ambivalent and they just wanted to keep using what they had used. <laughs> okay. Um, a relevant one, I think. Do you have any feedback from your students about the reception of QGIS compared to the proper, uh, propriety alternatives? And Combining another one, does students understand very well than offline uh, or very well than uh, the propriety alternative? Um, I think we have we have tried to make it clear the reasons why people might choose uh, one software uh, versus the other, and have tried to tie it to their career goals. So if they know that they might be working in an environment where they um, they might not have the the budget for the proprietary software or they want maximum flexibility or openness uh, then they can go that direction um i think in in terms of usability i haven't heard um i haven't heard any particular kinds of uh, complaints or praises directed one way or the other i think it's just working for students mostly and so i'm, I'm grateful for that I do think we've had a few that were intimidated by the, you know, where I showed where lots of tools show up in the search and there's kind of a different user experience uh, with the QGIS that were a little scared. And so they went back to the <laughs> proprietary software, but um, we've had ones who have gone the other direction as well and have gotten brave enough to try it out. So we want to encourage that. Cool. Um... One new question popped up. So are your students working with a desk software or are they working on a virtual environment or cloud sharing in a cloud, uh, having their data in the cloud or in their desktop? They're all working on their own uh, individual environments and those range from Macs to really old PCs to newer uh, ones. Um, it's been hard to it's it's hard to predict what they have <laughs> it's um i was a little apprehensive about having them all install uh postgres and postgis uh just because that installation process is a little more involved than the qgis one but i actually didn't hear uh <laughs> didn't hear about many issues so i think it was i think it was working cool um one last question i think just new one popped up but uh, i'm just going to uh and 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 the session and go on with the next presentation. Uh, did your courses get into geospatial customization and programming like Python, JavaScript, etc., or are you having an intention to incorporate them as well? Good point. So we did we did have a more advanced course where I started teaching uh, the use of some uh, leaflet just with uh, kind of basic GeoJSON layers. We also have a uh, a course on uh, programming and customization. That one, because I was doing so much uh, upgrading of these other courses and, and adding to them, I, I have left that one uh, using um, ArcPy and ArcGIS software. But again, I think that's a logical kind of next step to expand into that course and look at uh, open source APIs for, uh, for customization. Uh, thanks a lot. Um, lots of questions, lots of discussions. So it was I great. appreciate Thank that. You. Thank you, everybody. Um, Thanks. Yeah, I thank you too. I thank everybody too. Just feel free to interact with Sterling afterwards this presentation as, as well, because I have to make room for our next presentation. Uh, thank you, Sterling, and thanks everybody for the great questions and comments. Thank you so much. Okay, looking forward to looking forward to talk with you too.
Uh, goodbye. Definitely. Thank you. Goodbye.